coming. Hopefully my mic is now on. It's so great to see all of our families, um, both from Penn Medicine and from CHOP. And thank you to the organizers for doing such a phenomenal job of setting up the room and the food um, and the entire agenda. So I will start with a, an overview, generally, of the different types of heart muscle disease or cardiomyopathy, and a little bit about the medical management medical and touch on surgical, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Rosano. So what is a familial cardiomyopathy, or heart muscle disease? It's when one change in your DNA, one single change sometimes, can lead to an abnormality in the way your heart is structured and the way it functions. And believe it or not, just that one misspelling or change in the blueprint can result in a heart that looks differently and functions differently. And when it's passed on from generation to generation, we call it a familial cardiomyopathy. So here are the different forms in broad terms that we think about for familial cardiomyopathy. Starting at the top is pictured a normal heart, and I'll use this screen to point. And then your heart can really change in several different ways. One, it can become dilated. That means that the chambers of the heart become large and the walls become thin. We think of that as a weakened heart muscle. Another way that it can change is it can become hypertrophic. And that means the walls become thick and the heart is often stiff and it doesn't relax as well. Another way that it can change is you can have what we call arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. That can affect the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart. And oftentimes you get abnormal heart rhythms or the electrical system that's not working well. There's a couple of subtypes that are a little less common but still very important. One is called non-compaction. With non-compaction, your heart is dilated and big, but it also has a spongy appearance to the inside of the heart walls, and that's pictured here. And finally, we have restrictive cardiomyopathy, a little bit more rare, and it's kind of an offshoot of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the heart is very stiff, but the walls aren't too thick. And those are the general types of cardiomyopathy. Some of you may recognize these. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we tailor your diagnosis and your treatment based on what your heart looks like and how it functions. if we can get the slide. Can you advance for me? There we go. So here's another picture on pathology of the different forms of cardiomyopathy. And again, dilated up top, hypertrophic or thick pictured here, non-compaction or spongy here, and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy affecting the right side there. So Dr. Rosano will touch on how these conditions are transmitted or passed along from generation to generation, but suffice it to say that one genetic change has a 50% chance of being passed on to each child, 50% that you got it from mom or dad, 50% with each child that it's passed on. The overview of the treatment is that first we rely on making a good diagnosis. We want to be sure that you actually have one of these conditions, and we do some testing to clarify that. And then we talk to you about perhaps medications, some lifestyle changes, and maybe ablation for rhythm problems. We also talk about various devices that might benefit you, like a pacemaker, a defibrillator, or even something like a ventricular assist device. There are some surgeries that can benefit um, folks with a thick heart, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if all of that isn't enough, and you're still remaining very symptomatic, and we're worried that you may die from your condition, only then do we pursue heart transplant. That's our last option. We try to get everything else done first. Here's a couple of pictures of a patient who has dilated cardiomyopathy. That's where the heart is big, the walls are thin, the heart is weakened and that you can see pictured on the left. The squeezing function is not normal. You can see the normal heart, smaller in size, a little bit thicker wall, and a nice squeeze with each heartbeat. 
When your heart is weakened like this, you can get symptoms of shortness of breath, chest discomfort, palpitations, difficulty exercising. You feel like you just don't have enough umph. You can also start to retain fluid. You can also, importantly, have no symptoms at all and have a weakened heart muscle. And that's one of the reasons why imaging your heart or taking a picture of it is very important so that we know, do you have this condition and you don't have any symptoms, or do you have symptoms? The treatment of dilated cardiomyopathy hinges on what the heart looks like and what's going wrong. So what I learned in medical school, which I didn't know right away, is that it's actually not just your heart that is involved. It's your brain, it's your kidneys, and it's your blood vessels. And the heart is responsible for getting blood to all of those organs. And when those organs aren't getting enough blood supply, they react. And some of their reaction in the beginning is helpful, but over time becomes harmful. And that's what we target when we think about medications for weakened heart muscles. We try to slow the heart rate down, get rid of some fluid, which we call diuresis. And we try to open up the blood vessels that are in your legs with medication to allow the heart to do less work. Because the heart is weak, we try to make it easier for blood to get out. Having a fast heart rate, holding on to fluid, and constricting your blood vessels is harmful in this condition. And that's how we tailor your medical therapy. One of the drugs we use is called a beta blocker. You may have heard some of the names, metoprolol, toprolexel, Coreg, or carvedilol. These medications save lives, and they make your heart stronger. So if you have a dilated form of cardiomyopathy, we usually try to put you on one of these medicines. The other medicines we use, which you may have heard the terms, are ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and some water pills or diuretics. And the reason we use these medicines, again, in large studies of thousands of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, these drugs have been shown to save your life, make you live longer, and improve your heart function. And so we usually use these medications as well. There are a couple of new kids on the block, and Dr. Kim will address these drugs in her talk, but one of them is called Entresto. This may be a game changer for patients with dilated forms of cardiomyopathy. It has been shown, again, to improve survival and to make you feel better. It works in a similar way, opens blood vessels, makes you urinate, gets rid of salt and fluid. It also lowers your blood pressure, and we use it instead of the ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker because part of the drug includes an angiotensin receptor blocker. Evabradine is another medication. Um, it's used in a smaller group of patients, not as much beneficial effect as we've seen with Entresto. If all of those medicines fail and you still feel poorly, you're still having heart failure, we then move to something called a ventricular assist device or heart transplant. This is a ventricular assist device. It's a pump. It's put in surgically, so it's open heart surgery, which we don't undertake lightly. And it has a um, cannula or a tube that goes into your left ventricle, which is the main pump of the heart. And it takes the blood out of your heart and puts it into your aorta, which is your big blood vessel that takes the blood to the rest of the body. So it essentially takes over the squeezing function of your heart on the left side, and we can do a separate pump for the right side. Patients either live with this device for the rest of their lives, we call that destination therapy, or they live with the pump until they receive a heart transplant. And there are a lot of new pumps out uh, that we may talk about a bit later. Moving on to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that's when your heart muscle is thick. Same MRI here. So you can see that we often get MRIs because the pictures are crystal clear. It's very easy for us to measure the wall thickness, how the heart is squeezing when you get an MRI. And on the left, this heart is thick. It's squeezing very aggressively. This, again, is your normal heart for reference. And when your heart is thick and stiff, you can get symptoms of shortness of breath, 
chest discomfort, palpitations. You can even get dizzy, lightheaded, or pass out if you're not able to get the blood out uh, the way it should. So there can be a mechanical obstruction to blood flow, and we'll talk about that. Treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, importantly, therapy in HCM is guided by symptoms. We do not yet have very large randomized studies where we give half the people a sugar pill, half the people a drug, and figure out if the drug saves lives. We're working on it, but we're not quite there yet. So we're guided by symptoms. With HCM, it's helpful to have a slow heart rate to relax your heart muscle and to stay hydrated so that your heart is full and it can eject blood more efficiently. It's detrimental or harmful to be dehydrated, have an empty heart, or a fast heart rate. So we do use medications to slow your heart rate. Here's some heart cells beating in a dish on a research study, and you, we can use medications like metoprolol and atenolol, toprolexel. We can use calcium channel blockers like diltiazem and verapamil to slow the heart rate. Occasionally, we use diuretics. They have to be used carefully in patients with HCM. And you can see, beating on the left is a heart that's beating more strongly and forcefully, and here a heart that's beating more slowly. If you have obstructive HCM, meaning you can't get blood out of your heart effectively because a thick part of the muscle is sticking out in the way, right here usually in the septum, we can either do an alcohol ablation where we actually cause a controlled heart attack right to the blood vessel that's giving blood flow to the thickest part of the heart and we thin it by causing a small heart attack or we go in surgically and our surgeon, Dr. Atluri, wasn't able to be here today but he goes in through the aorta and just cuts out a little bit of the thickened part of the muscle you got to pick a team you're comfortable with. So with all of the medical care and your family's <laughs> medical care, always make sure that you're comfortable with your team and that they've done this a lot. Experience matters. There is a novel therapy for HCM that's coming down the road. And again, Dr. Lynn will talk about this in her talk. This may be a game changer for HCM. It's in clinical trials now. Arrhythmias or electrical problems can affect thick hearts, it can affect thin hearts, any kind of heart. And they basically come in two big categories, atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. Atrial fibrillation affects the top chamber of the heart, ventricular tachycardia affects the bottom chamber. Atrial fibrillation puts you at risk for stroke. And so we usually start a blood thinner, sometimes medication, and we sometimes electrically put you back into sinus rhythm called a cardioversion. With ventricular tachycardia, it can make you pass out and it can even make you die. And for those patients, we consider something called a defibrillator. The devices fall into two big categories, both pacemakers and defibrillators. Um, our medical team will talk about that on the various tracks. But a pacemaker, make sure that your heart doesn't go too slow. And a defibrillator treats you if your heart goes way too fast. If you have that life-threatening arrhythmia called ventricular tachycardia, it's able to shock your heart from the inside to put it back into a normal rhythm. We have various types of the devices now, some that have um, one wire, some that have no wires. And again, we'll talk more about that in the medical track. When we get to the end, meaning all of these therapies that are new and effective have allowed people to live longer with these cardiomyopathies, which is a good thing. But after 20 or 30 years of living with cardiomyopathy, sometimes more, sometimes less, some people advance to end-stage heart failure. And when that happens, it's critical to pick it up early before you've had any damage to your kidneys or your liver or other organs. We do that by special exercise tests that tell us where you are in your disease progression. And if the time is right, we will consider a heart transplant. I'm going to stop there. Here's our wonderful team, many of whom are in the audience today. 
and are happy to discuss all of these issues with you, and we'll see you at the breakout sessions. And I will leave you with just one last cartoon that I thought was interesting. I wish somebody would have showed me this when I was in medical school about the interplay of heart failure. Thanks so much. <laughs>